The move index. Uh, this is the market year, which they have a bunch of good charts on this site. Um, I talked about the Fed balance sheet earlier, uh, volatility, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing that I want to look at here was the move index, which let me, oh, let me get this my thing out of the way. Yeah, so I mean, this is the Fed balance sheet, which I was talking about in the last video. The Fed balance sheet has actually started to come down as of last week. Uh, they just posted the updated Fed balance sheet numbers, the Fed BS. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, yeah, so the Fed, the Fed BS for the first time this entire year since, oh, I don't know, the middle of last year, I guess, um, when they stopped doing tightening. Um, the Fed BS has started to decrease the first time just now, just today, they posted the the new balance sheet numbers. Fed BS is going down. VIX, I know we saw, has been going up. Um, and uh, the VIX started to kind of trail and get me eh, today, but um, I just saw I just saw the closing the closing move today pop the VIX again. So the VIX is breaking out to the upside. The Fed balance sheet is coming down. Uh, and that is huge, huge, huge. Um, but also, uh, I wanted to look at the move index on this. And so the move index is, uh, it's a volatility index for bonds and for the bond trading. And so uh, right before the crash, the move index went absolutely nuts. And it came all the way down to a pretty, not a historic low, but but to a real bottom. And we just started to get a little breakout to the upside on the move here. And so just looking at the VIX, um, yeah, so the, I mean, the VIX, you know, obviously during the crash did a crazy big move. And now it looks to be moving up a little bit. The move looks to be moving up a little bit. I showed the, uh, the dollar breaking to the upside, a pretty clear breakout and it continued today. Um, so it looks like the dollar is making a decent move to the upside. Uh, let me, um, let me scroll through a few things on this site because there's a bunch of cool charts that came out in the past day or two. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> so uh, the VIX is stubbornly high. Uh, I saw, yeah, I saw a note that says like the VIX is not going to come down below whatever, 25 or something until we get a vaccine. So I, I don't know about a vaccine, um, but this is, this is just like, uh, if the VIX is up, <laughs> but <laughs> they're just saying like, it doesn't matter what you buy, just like buy anything. Um, but yeah, the, the VIX is, the VIX is up and uh, it's continuing up. It looks like it's, it's making a little bit more of a move up now. Uh, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff in, um, so yeah the options the option a uh, bunch of option contracts just expired now and so the gamma unclenching so the gamma is the kind of moves that people bet on with the options and now that the options expire there's like oh no there's a one or two week period minus 40 percent of the the gamma set so we could see big moves here just because of the options expiry potentially and we have a super high vix and the <laughs> second biggest spy candle since forever which is not i mean whatever this is not the biggest candle forever um but we we did get a decent candle near close and then you can see the channel here. I haven't been drawing uh, drawing this channel out uh, because on my model I have I have these angled bull market trend lines uh, that have been trending the last two years. One of them, and then down here there's one that's been trending like 12 years. And so I've been just looking uh, along action along my trend lines. So yeah, yeah, okay, this channel I guess. So I guess if you're watching this channel, maybe this corner is interesting, but um, for me, this area up here where we uh, rejected is underneath 
the the two year trend line off the 2018 bottom and yeah today we got enough of a continuation downward that it looks like a real downward move uh maybe um yeah this is good to have a long-term trend line so i think this is a 200 day moving average here i usually do a 120 day just because it gets a little curvier and gets more reactions but you can kind of see the downward target on a down move is just here uh, not much below where it closed today and so that's kind of probably opening next week like monday tuesday uh, for a bear target is just to get down here and see what kind of action we get along that trend line and here's the uh, the nasdaq index and so a little bearish candle and oh maybe a double top on the nasdaq so i, I don't know maybe whatever um, nasdaq's absolutely nuts it looks like oh man i don't know I don't know. Even if, even if this is a reversal point on the Nasdaq, I don't exactly like a, a Nasdaq kind of short position now because uh, this infotech sector, which kind of dominates the Nasdaq, is still the only sector that's still doing stock buybacks. And so you can get this huge move here. You know, and like the the Russell and the financials and things like that that are uh, didn't get the huge the huge move up. It got it still got a bull run, but um, those are sectors that have exposure to the low interest rates, that have exposure to the solvency risks. They're not doing stock buybacks. Like as far as a short position, that's the kind of stuff uh, I'm looking at more as a short position. The Nasdaq, I mean, I guess potentially has more room to move down as far as the size of a, a short bet, but the odds of a short bet being a good idea are smaller, I think. so. Um, yeah, okay, so maybe a double top. Maybe it'll reverse out of the NASDAQ. Um, but it's entirely possible that other things do make a bearish move in the NASDAQ. Maybe just, who knows? It's It's been nutty, and they're still doing stock buybacks. And this is, and across the entire world economy, there's sort of a generic chart that, you know, that kind of wavy S, S, you know, S&P kind of chart across a ton of sectors, across a ton of different countries, you see, uh, well, actually, um, like the Hong Kong looks a lot like the like the XLF, which I guess is maybe expected because Hong Kong is really just like a financial center. So it looks like the financials, but most of the countries, you know, if you look at like England, it's like a low S&P. If you look at like the German stock exchange, it's sort of like uh, Germany stock exchange actually popped. I think it's actually a little higher than the S&P, uh, but the general shape of most of the charts looks very similar to sort of the S&P shape. But the Nasdaq just did this crazy, crazy blast. So yeah, for anyone that wants to short this thing, I guess the the size of a move down is worth considering uh in the event that we do get a short like if we got another liquidation kind of event even though there's not really signals of a of a big liquidation event like this as far as like the international you know currency squeeze it doesn't look like that um, but we are getting signals that the u.s like the primary banks are you know i looked at i looked at some charts from jeff snyder yesterday or two days ago i guess and it's showing that the U.S. banks are kind of competing with the international banks for the the last resort kind of liquidity and um, and the individual bond buying that everyone thinks that the Fed is like blowing stuff up like crazy. Oh no, um, the Fed's not buying anything. The the Fed decreased the balance sheet as of two weeks ago. The balance sheet went flat. As of last week, the balance sheet is headed down. Um, they released some information on what they're buying most of everything they're buying is just treasuries and some mortgage-backed securities the mortgage-backed securities has increased a little bit but um you know they're buying like a tiny sliver of of etfs that you know contain corporate bonds and so they're announcing individual companies they want to buy 
Um, but that will probably decrease the balance sheet more. So instead of buying a, you know, a corporate bond that has a whole mess of 20 something companies, like if they just want to buy bonds from like one bank that's having a liquidity problem, that can be a much smaller move than buying a whole thing. So that whole Fed crazy corporate bond blasting news that everybody has been going nuts about the whole last week is completely, completely nonsense. Um, and they could they could start buying more stuff, but they're not right now. The Fed balance sheet is going down, 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 down for the first time, as I showed already in this video, for the first time uh, this entire year. And uh, yeah, the Russell, the IWMs, the Russells closed down a little bit, whatever. Uh, yeah, everything kind of closed down a little bit today. Oh, okay. Yeah, so here here they've laid out the, the 2009 crash with a huge reversal bull market out, and they've compared it to the action right now. And so they're like, okay, are we switching into a super long, another, whatever, the 12-year bull market that we saw last time? Um, and this is a fun overlay, and I'm sure you can grab any number of bull market or bear markets and throw it on top of here and say like it looks kind of similar but the thing is with the 2008 crash this purple or pink part here is is that we had the we had the everything bubble support line here and the the financial crisis crashed right down to the everything bubble support line and then it reversed up into a higher level support line. So we have the floor of the everything bubble down here is like a 40 year bull market support line. And the everything bubble came down to that line and reversed out into a higher trend line, which is our 12 year support line that started here and supports this whole thing. So if you look at the orange line here, the 12 year support line, well, that ran through this whole part of the pink part, uh, it kind of slices through the middle of this stuff. And then we have another support, bull support line here. And so as far as just like mapping the shape of a bubble and where the actual support lines are, uh, this crash, this V-shaped crash into a bull market, crashed down to a support line, and then it reversed out into a higher level support line, um, which that's a super rare, rare event. That happened here. It happened in 2008. We did that, and in, in the 20, uh, the 2018 crash, that also happened where we crashed down to this support line, and then we reversed up into an even higher support line into the uh, sort of the everything bubble pop where we got the big drop. But um, these kind of V-shaped recoveries, like this, is not a recovery. This is a crash down to a previous support line and this pop is into a higher level bull market line and that is something in the structure when you're building up a bubble that is a really rare thing um and that's not at all like what happened here like here we crashed down and we broke through two support lines down and then we came up and back checked uh, this one like we back tested this one here we back tested this support line here um, and then we we managed to break through the this support line that supported this whole move, the 12 year support line. And then this top hit the bottom of the two year, sort of the Volmageddon support line. Uh, I'll show you that on the S&P, but as far as the structure of these two things, not related in any way as far as uh, support lines and the structure of a bubble goes, but I'll show you that in the chart. Oh, what's this chart say? Are we back to kill vol? I don't know what this is even showing. The move, uh, the move is trending up right now. This doesn't really show. I don't know this. I don't know what this chart's trying to show. Let's move on. Greed and fear, 50-50. <laughs> yeah, it keeps flipping back and forth on the bull to bear kind of thing. And you can see that in the put calls. Let's take a look at the put calls. Um, but as far as the bullish or bearish sentiment, I keep seeing people posting like. Oh, it's so bearish. It's so bullish, blah, blah, blah. But it just like every day almost, it keeps like flipping back and forth. Nobody knows what's going on. 
Uh, I don't know if this, this, um, this blog's not like a bearish blog, but there's a bunch of bearish kind of stuff they're posting here. Um, so it's talking about V-shaped recovery as far as, <laughs> yeah, the bankruptcies aren't doing a V. Okay, so this uh, this huge line here is the unemployment rate, which obviously went nuts. Um, but here's the, the Chapter 11 filings, you know, which were high in the financial crisis crash and obviously came down quite a bit. Um, they're just starting to trend up again now, uh, but it's not going crazy. So I don't know what they're trying to say. No V shape for bankruptcies. What would a V shape for bankruptcies be? I mean, like higher? That would be bad. I don't know. But anyway, the bank the bankruptcies are starting to happen a little bit now, uh, but they haven't gone crazy yet. But the unemployment is obviously pretty high. Oh, here's a credit card consumer spending kind of thing. Uh, which fell off after the crash. People stopped spending, and now they're kind of resuming. Okay. Oh, call option bonanza. So everybody went all in on calls, and those got kind of blasted here. Um, but a more realistic explanation is that people actually are hedging upside with long calls uh, rather than going all in. Okay. Well, you can see, I mean, you can just see here that the, I mean, the puts went extreme when the market was way down and the calls went extreme way at the top. Uh, and now we're all the way back at sort of a middle, not interesting area at this point, uh, which happened. And then this came right at the, at the top and there was, over 12 million call options opened like right at the top that immediately just got um immediately just got a long squeeze which is pretty brutal for everyone that opened the calls here uh very i mean very similar to people that open all the puts at the very bottom of the crash and then obviously got <laughs> got short squeezed for like months on on this area um, but you can see here that the put call ratio uh, is pretty kind of medium. Uh, we can look at the put calls here. I don't think that's anything too dramatic. Um, but the amount of calls that were open on the last peak was a historical record by like four times or something. I think a normal, a normal put call kind of thing at a peak for calls is like four million calls or something like that. And this was more than 12 million calls that were opened uh, at that last peak, which is crazy. And, and we know that like people have been opening a crazy amount of accounts and all that sort of stuff. Oh, <laughs> fiscal bazooka. Okay. So this is a mix of uh, fiscal policies versus loans versus government guarantees across a bunch of countries. Uh, South Korea, South Africa is pumping a lot. Uh, so there's a lot of countries that are doing fiscal operations here, which means like not necessarily uh, helicopter money, but it's government spending operations basically versus like a central bank kind of loan. Well, they're putting government loans here. But generally when you're saying fiscal, you're saying like government spending versus like the central bank loans. And I don't know. I don't know what they mean by government loans here. Uh, but you can just see kind of the emerging market spending. South Korea? South Korea's emerging market? Okay. Um, and then the developed markets. Yeah, Germany and Italy going crazy. Everyone, 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 everyone is just doing like a ton of stimulus moves. And this is kind of a look at sort of the, the dollar versus other currencies. Um, basically, I mean, basically, if you compare a move like this from any random country in their own currency, like that is a huge, huge move against the dollar because the dollar is like 70% of the money supply. It's like if America did a move like this size, it's diluted against, you know, 70% of the entire worldwide money supply is dollars. So the Fed printing like $1 trillion against 70% of the entire world 
is a much smaller percentage than an individual country, you know, like uh, Brazil or something. Like you see Brazil doing this, and Brazil just gets like destroyed against the dollar when they do it. Um, but yeah, definitely the the U.S. and the Fed is not the only country going crazy with uh, with central bank or with fiscal policies. You can see all the countries are going crazy like this. And then uh, when you look at like the EU area, uh, they're really, really going nuts. So this is a huge thing to look at for like the, uh, well, I guess, you know, like Germany and Italy are doing this huge blast and you can see like the DXY going up, which is largely the dollar against the European countries, but it's a basket of everything. But uh, when the European countries really do a blast, um, it really sends the dollar higher against these currencies because they have the ability to really devalue their currency and it's hard for the U.S. to keep up when they do it. And that's kind of like the Brent Johnson dollar milkshake idea. And so we may be actually seeing the milkshake thing start now on this last dollar breakout. And he's been talking about it for a while. as like a long-term thing, like, you know, I don't know, the next maybe year to five years. I don't know really what the timeline he's thinking of uh, for that to play out. But uh, just, you know, like the, like the Euro is a big currency, but it's only, I think it's less than 30% of the worldwide monetary supply. So when the EU countries do a blast, like they're doing a huge blast. Like if, if the EU countries do a trillion against 30% of the monetary supply, versus the U.S. doing a, a trillion against 70% of the monetary supply. Like that U.S. blast is less than half as powerful, basically, on the exchange, like on the DXY. Um, so that that's why you can see the dollar pushing up. As other countries, it's way easier for them to inflate if they want to. If they want to inflate to reduce their debt burden, if they want to inflate to lower their commodity prices to compete, <clears throat> they can. And so countries, you know, like South Africa or something like that, like this little blast here from South Africa is huge because that's just a tiny, tiny percent of the monetary supply. And this is a commodity country. And so they want to get their commodity prices competitive. They want to decrease their, you know, their loan burden and stuff like that. And so when you see a blast like this from like Brazil or South Africa, like this is a huge blast and you can look at their charts like this destroys their currency against the dollar when they do this. Um, and that's intentional. They want to do that to decrease. They have to play, pay loans in dollars so they can get, they can print their own currency to get money to pay dollar loans. And also the inflation just decreases the loan burden. Um, so that, yeah, that's kind of the dollar milkshake and you can see the countries printing, <clears throat> but it's good to look at the, the currency pairs to see what it really looks like. Munchen has a bazooka. What is this talking about? <clears throat> oh, the, oh yeah, the treasury cash balance. Oh wait, what is this thing? Oh, the, oh my goodness, forecast. Oh, I hope they don't do that right now. Okay, so yeah, like one and a half, yeah, it's like, the one and a half trillion, they're for, oh goodness. So this is possible that we see this. I, I don't think that's going to happen like this week. Um, but the Treasury General account, which, I mean, historically, well, before 2008, the Treasury General account was part of the, like the primary banks. It was not at the Fed. Since 2008, they moved the Treasury General account to a Fed account. and the Treasury General account is where the Congress, the Treasury stores cash that they're going to use for government spending, basically. So like if they issue bonds and the Fed buys the bonds, that's where that money goes into the Treasury General account. And that's money that the, the Congress can spend. Um, or if they collect taxes, like the taxes go into that account. They take the tax money out of the economy. They hold it in the Treasury General account until they want to spend it back into the economy. And so historically, before 2008, I mean, the Treasury General account was tiny and it was at private banks, like, uh, you know, individual, like primary dealer banks. But since 2008, it has been higher. And since 
this crash, like it went absolutely nuts up to like one and a half trillion. And this chart, I don't know where they're getting this. Hold on, let me open this up and see if there's a reason they did this forecast. Yeah, I don't know. I just read it. It doesn't say anything useful. It just says like if they bring it down to a normalized le level and the TGA, the Treasury General General Account, this is, um, yeah, this is the money that the Congress holds for government spending. If they bring it to normalized levels, it would be a risk positive story. Okay, so, I mean, basically they're saying like this is a normalized level, whatever that means. At some point, they can and probably will spend this into the economy and that can be done fast like they can do that in one or two weeks like bang and they could pump like a trillion dollars into the economy and this i call it the helicopter general account like when the fed loans money even with zero interest rates they're not spending into the economy as like cash that people spend they're creating bank reserves it goes onto the bank balance sheets then the banks can use that to kind of, you know, create loans to different companies. And then the companies can, you know, maybe use it for buybacks or this and that. But it's several, several steps for the Fed money to actually get, you know, through the, from the Fed to the primary dealers, to other banks, to companies. Then the companies have to spend that kind of into the economy through like paying employees and, it's a bunch of steps removed from actually creating spending money for normal people. But when the fish, when the treasury spends, like they just pay it directly to people. And so, you know, they're talking about a million or sorry, a million, a trillion dollar, um, you know, infrastructure bill coming out soon. And so like, if they just want to spend it, they don't have to talk to anyone. They don't even have to issue bonds or talk to the fed. If, like they can just go like bang and they could spend a trillion on infrastructure like in one day if they want to do that um, or like for you know for the the helicopter paycheck stimulus checks whatever to individual people if they want to drop a half a trillion on helicopter checks to random people like bang they can do it like they can do it in one week if they want and that has big uh, inflationary kind of implications. So basically what I was looking at for this treasury account, well, I mean, we saw we saw that the Fed account, the Fed balance sheet's going down as of last week, it flattened out uh, and started going down now. And the treasury account is still going up. Like they're projecting a down move, but no, like this, this is still going up. So, this is basically taking liquidity out of the market on both ends. The Fed balance sheet's going down and this account's going up. And this account takes liquidity out, um, out of the economy, out of the market, and it holds it for government spending. And then when they spend it into the market, um, that's inflationary cash in regular people's back pocket that they can spend. And so if and when they do this, there's basically two theories. Uh, one is they might want to pump this out around election time just to get the velocity of money up to make people happy or something before the election to get spending money. And then it would take a while for the inflation effects to kind of happen. So it would look good before the election. Uh, that's one theory, not my theory. My theory on this is this is a inflation uh bazooka they said bazooka right <laughs> yeah okay so uh the the interest rates the bond trading the gdp is all sort of pointing at the sort of the bonds well the bonds trading up which would push interest rates down and so like the fed you know they'll announce like a lower interest rate but really it's the bond trading that pushes the interest rates down and then the fed's like okay, now we're announcing a different interest rate. They didn't just randomly pick that number. They're not doing something crazy. Like that's where the bonds have traded to. And then they're like, okay. And then they announce the number. Like I completely say all the time that the Fed does not control the interest rates other than just guessing where they're going to be. And then just announcing like, hey, we want you to trade here. And sometimes they'll announce the same number a couple of times in a row. 
and it shows up as like a straight line, you know, on the on the chart of like the Fed's holding this rate. Um, but by the time they've held it straight for two or three, you know, quarters, it's already traded pretty far away from there. And then they just announced all of a sudden like, oh, well now it's over here somewhere. Um, but if you actually throw the Fed rate on top of the actual bond trading, it's like, oh, okay. They're just following the bond trading. So they can kind of guess where it's going, but sometimes they get it wrong and then they have to announce like an emergency, whatever. But with regards to the, the Treasury General account, they have a mess of money in here. It's over one and a half trillion just cash money that they can use for any kind of government spending they want. And they can do it without asking anybody or I guess they, I mean, for most things, they'd have to pass a bill to do this. So it's not like overnight, but they have bills right now in Congress for over a trillion dollars of infrastructure spending that they're negotiating about now. And then, you know, the stimulus checks, oh my God, they have, I don't know how many pages they have. A, they have a stimulus check bill that's some absurd number of pages long. <laughs> and it's just like, give everyone like a thousand bucks or something. That's the whole bill is should be able to write it in like two lines, but it's who knows what all crazy nonsense they have in there. But if they pass one of those bills, they can spend it in a minute. But I don't think that's the plan. Like, I think that they want this money ready to go. If U.S., you know, if the bonds trade to where there's negative interest rate pressure on where, where they would need to set like the Fed funds rate to a negative amount, they don't want, they don't want the interest rates to go negative. And this is an inflationary kind of spending they can do. And that's when I think they'll do it. I think as soon as they see that the Fed might need to announce negative interest rates, if the, if it's trading down, if the bonds are trading, the interest rates down below zero, they're going to go, oh shit. And they're going to pump this. And this is inflationary and it should push the interest rates up. And that is when I think they'll do it. And I think it could be a bigger move than this. I mean, they could just go like bang, like, one and a half trillion like right now like in a week and so that <laughs> i mean if you're trading the stock market um like any day any day any random day that you're just sitting there looking at your stocks like they could go and just bang like drop a trillion on the general economy and spending could go nuts and i don't know the consequences of that if people would put that in the stock market or not who knows like they may like they were talking about how much individual traders were putting into the stock market as a result of just like a one stimulus check last time, which is, yeah, I, yes, people did increase the amount they were putting into the stock market, um, but the savings rate went up way, way more than like stock market investing. So I think that story is a little bit overblown, but the Fed balance sheet and the general, uh, the Treasury general account, <laughs> the helicopter general account is definitely stuff to watch. And right now, the Fed balance sheet is going down, decreasing liquidity. And this is not going down. This forecast is not happening this week. This is still going up. And when this goes up, that takes liquidity out of the market also. It's money that's held out, held out of the economy until they decide to spend it. Um, anyways, TGA is really important. Oh, COVID. Yeah, the COVID rates are going up pretty much everywhere right now. Oh, VIX under the hood. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this is a secret. I mean, the VIX popped hard and it's still up. Um, I don't know why they're saying under the hood. It's still elevated. Yeah, it is still elevated. So, I mean, basically this kind of level down here is bull market VIX kind of below 20. And this kind of gap up to this range in the 30s, and we're even above the 30s now, like in the 40s or higher is super volatile and you can get really huge moves. Um, so this is lower. This has swung up a little bit since then. And yeah, we have high VIX, high, vol high volatility right now. JP Morgan, I think, JPM, uh, I'm going to hold on a sec. 
Oh, okay. Uh, JP Morgan is rebalancing uh, upper estimate or something. And there's a small correction now. And they're saying there's negative equ equity rebalancing happening right now. And that's a dip that should be bought. So this is a bullish, uh, a bullish article from JP Morgan saying that they're rebalancing portfolios and it should be up from here. Uh, bond yields, if bond yields rise too fast, equities might struggle. So, yeah, this is an interesting one because they issued a ton of new bonds now and the bond rates have been kind of waving around. Uh, but the longer term bonds have been pushing up over the last two weeks. So we've been getting like a little bit of a, a steepening yield curve, which which should be a little bit inflationary, which I think is what they want. I think they want it a little bit inflationary and it never went to negative rates. So it's going for, you know, from near zero to near sort of two on the steepening yield curve for the bonds. <clears throat> and uh, we'll have to see, we'll have to see how that trades over the next couple of weeks. But I think they like that. I think they want it to be a little bit steep and that would create a little bit of inflation, creates a little bit of a positive trading environment for the financials, for the banks. Um, so the steepening yield curve is, I think, is generally a, a good thing. And if they want to lower that, they'll buy a ton of the longer dated treasury bonds. But it's kind of a mess to go try and buy a bunch of like 10, 20, 30 year treasuries. Um, that would that would really raise the Fed's balance sheet up to do that. I don't think they want to do that right now. And also they just... Well, they just gave themselves the ability to buy individual corporate bonds instead of treasuries. And I think they're going to be playing around with that next time more than treasuries. Uh, but yeah, anyway, the treasuries are trading up a little bit. Oh, I don't know. China, macro, macro. And so this is just kind of growth indicators in China showing that China is reopening and their growth is going up in pretty much all the categories. Macro on fire. Oh, hold on, let me read this one. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. I don't know what data they're talking about with the macro data. Some data point that I don't know about has gone positive. So this is a bullish one. Oh, something went positive. Uh, apples ahead. Yeah, okay. It's a it's ahead right now. It says that Apple usually underperforms S and P. But this year they're talking about operating systems. Okay, whatever. Um, right now Apple is doing well. Uh, who's hot and who's not? Renewables. Oh, okay. Digital, yeah. Infotech is way up. Renewables, NASDAQ, uh, S&P. Yeah, so this is kind of interesting, like which sectors are going crazy. But all of them are following the same general chart. I think it's really cool. So if you, um, yeah, if you go and compare all the different world economies, uh, this is one thing, this is one thing that I've been kind of scratching my head about because people have been talking about, okay, the Fed, you know, is pumping money to the, the euro dollar system to other countries to keep the other countries functioning and that's where this extra flow of dollars has come from from the other countries but if they're balancing away from their equities and their currencies into the u.s assets why is the chart the same across all the different countries like this i mean a little height difference in different sectors but i don't get it like that i don't think that's how the flow is working I think the Fed money that got pumped, all those trillions of dollars, has gone to basically like the Treasury general account of different countries or to the individual banks, like the international banks have a fund that they hold for handling defaults. And those funds, uh, as we've seen in previous videos, have gone way up. And there's a ton of banks all across the world that service all the dollar loans for all the inter for all the countries and it's a huge threat of defaults right now the banks don't want to lend 
And that's where I think most of this Fed money has gone to those funds to handle defaults and just liquidity into the international markets. Like they created new swap lines, they created a new repo market for international banks to swap their collateral for cash. You know, the swap lines is for other central banks to swap their currencies directly for US dollars. And so that is where I, you don't get to actually see it, but that's where I think all of this, uh, you know, the Fed money went uh, because the international banking system just kind of screeched to a halt. And so they just blasted money at all these different, you know, uh, central banks and at all the, the, they're not primary dealer banks, but they function like a primary dealer bank, basically um, just the international banks that create dollar loans across the world. And so, yeah, just explaining, explaining how, I mean, everyone says like the Fed printed money, yeah, and the stock market goes up, yeah, like that's just obvious and it makes sense, but it's not obvious. And operationally, I don't know how the money is actually getting into the stock market from, from the Fed, you know, printing, because over the last 12 years, the Fed creates reserve money and that goes to the primary dealer banks and they can loan to companies or to other banks that can also loan to companies and then if the companies get good loans maybe they'll do stock buybacks and those stock buybacks will push the market up and that is really what has been driving the stock market over the last 12 years <clears throat> has been you know a couple steps down the chain where they do stock buybacks and so the outstanding total number of shares have been decreasing for the last, you know, 10 years or something. And the stock prices have been going up for 10 years. And this doesn't help productivity at all because the companies are spending their money on a stock buyback instead of doing anything productive. And so you have all these companies that aren't making any profit, um, are not increasing productivity, but the stock prices are going up, blah, blah, blah. But then we had the crash and now only the Infotech stocks are even doing buybacks anymore. And now we're switching into stocks issuing new shares in order to try to service their debt because they don't have the cash flow and it's a mess. So, so if the money is tighter, well, I mean, there's a, you know, a several trillion dollars printed. So that's not supposed to be tighter money, but if the companies aren't doing buybacks, then they're not getting extra liquidity for buybacks. And if the money is all going into the international banking system, then, you know, there's the theory that, okay, other countries and other countries' hedge funds maybe want to invest in the U.S. dollar or whatever. But when you look at the sectors across other countries like this chart, you can see that it's the same freaking shape as the U.S. chart. So if all the money is leaving there and coming into our market, our market should have a way different shape than these charts. And well, I guess if you look at the NASDAQ, it sort of does. So I don't know if that theory kind of holds, but operationally how the Fed money printing is actually getting into the stock market, I have yet to hear a good explanation for that uh, as a driving factor here. But uh, as of this week, the Fed balance sheet, as I showed, is going down. So I think we might be seeing a change in the, the liquidity regardless of how it works exactly. VXEEM, I don't know what that is. Uh, the VIX, that's a different volatility index that's very close to the VIX. Okay, um, sure. USO, uh, and the US oil is the crude, tracks the crude oil price roughly. <laughs> There's a few problems with the USO. Uh, one is it gets contango on the way up where they're rolling the contracts over or they're supposed to but when oil crashed back here uso got in trouble with their broker they lost the right or the ability to buy the monthly contracts and then they had to buy like uh, they had to buy like treasuries and stuff like that and they had to buy longer term uh you know oil contracts and so the uso now over the last like two months well, it has still done an okay job tracking the oil price somehow, but it doesn't have the same structure that it had before. And they're trying to negotiate to try to get it to, to track. But I just like to point out to people 
because uh, everybody's like, okay, we like oil, long oil. And I'm like, okay, that's good because, and this is not investment advice, but yeah, like oil completely crashed and it looks like a good market for oil going forward. Like that's a pretty standard thing to think. Um, and USO will go up. Wait, is this the USO down here? Know your product. Oh yeah, yeah. This is you. This is USO versus crude. I love this chart. I show this all the time. So, so USO did recover like this. Uh, it went up the whole time. Crude went up. But look, here's the actual crude price went like up, like actually way up. And USO because of the contango and because of the compounding that they have every day and the structure of the ETF, it just like the volatility and the contango and the rolling day to day and month to month just kills the upside. And it's just really hard for the USO to go up, but it's not hard for the USO to go down when oil goes down. So basically I never hold something like a USO long for, I mean, it's designed for day trading. Basically like if you trade it during the day, you don't have any contango, you don't have any compounding problems, but if you hold it overnight, you get compounding and you can get percentage losses every single day. And if you hold it month to month, like really long term, like the contango can just kill the upside movements plus the compounding every day. Plus if they actually get in trouble and they, they lose the ability to buy the contracts that they want to buy and they can't even track the price properly. Anyway, they're, USO is really poor at actually tracking the price of oil uh, for all of those reasons. It just doesn't go up. I mean, it does kind of go up when, when oil goes up, it does go up at the same time, but it doesn't track it up, like actually track the price. Uh, so this is a really cool chart and I show this kind of stuff all the time, uh, but I haven't seen anyone else do this and just show how far the USO price is away from the actual oil price. And so, uh, short, if you're shorting the USO long term, then the contango and the, you know, the compounding helps you like that. It's downward pressure on the stock that helps you if you're shorting it long term. So it's okay. Like if you bought like a two year put option or something on the USO, if you thought it was going to go down, like that structure is helping you. Um, but if you're holding it long, trying to go up with the oil price, this is what you get. You get this flattened out, super lame upward movement. That's a cool chart. Uh, World Health Organization says the pandemic's accelerating and spreading fast as of eight hours ago. So maybe we're going to get some more COVID news from the WHO and gold demand two stories. Let's see what this is. Okay, so this, this is gold ETFs, like trading in the stock market versus physical gold demand, like in India or something, just crashing. That's an interesting chart. Like physical gold is less, because this is not what people say, and I don't know how good this chart is, but, you know, everyone's saying like physical gold demand is way higher than anything, and it's just so hard to get physical, but this shows maybe not so much. Oh, here's another gold one that's cool. This is the gold volatility is cheap. Er, <laughs> way to play the breakout. Oh, so, right, like for people that want to go long gold, the GVZ is the gold volatility, which has been coming down. Um, and let's listen to what they say about it. Gold volatility behaves different to equity volatility, as gold itself is a hedge. So gold moving higher often occurs with gold volatility moving higher as well. So if you want to play the up on gold, you could actually just you could just hold the GVZ long, apparently, and that should go up when gold goes up. Um, gold's bouncing on the trend channel lows now here, um, as well as the 50-day moving average. So it's bouncing on a bunch of stuff that should push it up, and GVZ is at a low, which looks like super cheap relative to all the other volatility. So here's a potential breakout scenario for gold. And rather than just buying gold, you could go long the GVZ. 
which I haven't looked at the structure of the GVZ, but straight off, I would say no, that's immediately dumb because the GVZ most likely is like an ETN structure that has compounding every single day. And the longer you hold it, the more you lose um, day to day as just like all of these freaking ETNs that do this, they have this rolling kind of future structure and you just lose percentages every day on these things. And so usually with these kind of things like ETNs, the only the only thing I do with them is short them. Like I buy like long-term puts on them. Uh, if there's one in a situation that looks like it's, it's a good short, you can buy a long-term put. And even if it's trying to go up, like the structure of the thing helps you. And so you basically just get an asymmetry to the, the downside. Um, and and so holding any of these kind of things long is just a risk. So like, yeah, okay. I mean, this isn't like a historical low point. This is still higher than all the volatility coming in. But, uh, but yeah, like the volatility on most things kind of has bottomed higher than the previous level and gone back up because volatility is, we're just in a high volatility kind of thing right now. Yeah, so maybe like maybe this will trend up and okay. But you know, similar to the US oil thing, like if you're holding something like this long term, like there's just you just lose percentages like constantly and it's just kind of ugly. Even if you get the trend right, you just don't get the percentage like gain that you should out of stuff like this. So I without even looking at the structure of this thing, probably disagree with this, but I'm not sure exactly how this one is structured. Um, and the gold, oh, a couple more notes on gold. Like the GLD, everyone says like GLD for gold. Uh, the GLD custodian is HSBC, which is, well, it's headquartered in, uh, in England, but it operates mostly in Hong Kong, which has recently been overtaken by China. And also the company was basically bordering on bankruptcy prior to that move. And so that that's one of those international banks that probably got a bunch of money from the whole Fed blast, but um, it's a super, super risky bank. That's the custodian of the GLD. And so you have a, several layers of counterparty risk. You have political risk with China, you have counterparty risk with HSBC themselves. And then HSBC is in Hong Kong, but headquartered in London. So you have, you know, political risk between that um, on the corporate level. And then also the gold itself is, is held, uh, you know, by the, by the British government. And so the actual bank's claim on the gold versus the government's claim on the gold is questionable. So there's just like, tons of counterparty risk like stacked on top of each other as far as holding gld as though like you think you're holding gold you're not holding gold this is paper gold and i've seen a ton of articles saying like the amount of gold they actually have versus the amount of gold shares in the gld is not even close like there's not even a proper amount of gold backing these things so not investment advice but <laughs> I don't even trade GLD like day to day. Like I definitely don't hold it. Um, there's one called Sprott, uh, Sprott Physical Gold where it's actually one to one. You can get physical delivery on the gold. That's still paper gold, but that's a little bit better. Um, and it's PHYS is the ticker for Sprott, the physical gold. But like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna hold gold in a trading account, that's what I get is the Sprott gold. I never touch GLD. Um, and I don't trade the gold volatility index either. And also, I mean, you have to understand the structure of the thing and how the volatility actually works versus gold. They're saying it usually goes up when gold goes up. Mm, maybe, but not, not recently. That's not what's been happening. So yeah. Okay. Gold volatility index is low right now. Um, so that, should indicate that you shouldn't see a big breakout in the gold price if gold volatility is low. And I mean, it's been pretty boring and the gold volatility has gone down. So yeah, whatever for me, for me right now, like uh, I want to see, I want to see an actual setup for a trade on gold. It's just kind of been sitting here. 
And so maybe they're pointing out like a decent setup for a trade. Like they're showing that like this channel is up, you're on the bottom of the channel, you're on the bottom of the moving average, like gold should move up from here. That may be true. Uh, that may be a good trade setup to go long gold. But uh, once again, like all this crazy stuff with gold, yeah. I, I just buy I just buy like the spot physical if I want to hold it in a trading account. I don't get all fancy with it. I mean a call like a call on gold like I mean how much is gold actually gonna go up where that's worth it? I don't I don't know. Yeah, you just you just get the sprout physical and just hold it. That's the only thing that I would do here. And I actually actually kind of like kinda of like that setup. I might do that I might do that soon. Um, cause I think, yeah, I think gold looks pretty good in the inflation or the deflation scenario. Gold should do pretty well against the dollar and kind of all the scenarios, um, except for a liquidation. If we get, well, here's, you know, we got this big liquidation move down here. And so probably what's the BXY? I don't know what the BXY is, but it's lower than the S S and P. So given the strong rally and the high volatility, it's good risk reward. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anything's a good risk reward because everything has been moving up and down pretty much together. Um oh, and I was talking about gold, so like this big liquidation move drove gold down with it like if you get a liquidation sell off gold's going to go down and so that that's basically the mm, that's basically the only downside risk that i see at, on gold right now is if we get another liquidation move i don't want to hold any gold while that move is happening because that'll pull it down uh, but just like a general bear market or a deflation scenario gold should do well and an inflation scenario with hyperinflation, like gold should do pretty well. So I think most of the scenarios, other than a big liquidation, is good for gold. And that, I mean, that's basically what I'm, I want to see like the next couple of weeks is if we get sort of a liquidation move, like it looks like it might turn down, but you know, you get a little down move. That's not a liquidation sell out. Uh, but even just a little down move, maybe maybe pulls gold down a bit you know so if gold gets pulled down that's a spot uh, to buy it but i don't know i don't really want to mess with gold until i see if the if the market's gonna you know dump real junk oh lqd so lqd is the investment grade corporate bonds and junk is the junk grade corporate bonds and junk is underperforming the mighty LQD, as it should, because these are companies that are solvent, and these are companies that are not solvent. Uh, so the Fed announced that they're going to buy junk bonds. And so that doesn't mean they're going to buy like the J&K ETF, though, necessarily. Like they want to target companies that used just just prior to this uh, you know, collapse were uh, they were solvent they were investment grade and they just got downgraded to junk and so the fed's like okay well like we'll still consider buying those ones but then how do you target those uh, if you're buying like the whole junk etf that's like all of these bonds um but now that you know they announced they can buy individual bonds so that's another target maybe if they want to buy a couple of the junk bonds they could target them individually instead of buying the whole like junk etf um, that may be one reason kind of to announce that individual bond buying. But what I was thinking is that they want to probably target banks like the primary dealer banks. If they get, you know, if they get kind of a li liquidity squeeze, they're competing with international banks for like a little bit of, you know, repo kind of swap market money. Um, the Fed maybe wants to maybe wants to target some individual banks or some individual junk bonds or something like that. And so everyone's saying like they're buying everything like crazy and it's so nutty. But I think that really decreases the amount of liquidity that the Fed's going to pump because instead of buying a whole chunk of like J and K, they could just hit like one company 
with a way, way smaller liquidity amount and they can get the effect that they want. You know, uh, it's, it's kind of like a bailout if they're buying the bonds. It gives a little liquidity, but uh, they want to avoid doing actual bailouts because uh, this will provide more private liquidity and they're not holding everything on the balance sheet the same way. Uh, so, yeah, that's the kind of bond buying thing. It is, it's similar to a bailout, um, but it's not, it's not a bailout. So it's not like a government bailout loan with all the government bailout stipulations and all that stuff. Um, because a bailout has a big fiscal kind of thing with the whole government and the Congress dealing with it. Whereas the Fed buying a bond, they just hold the bond on the balance sheet and that's the end of it and nobody has to think about it again until they want to reduce the balance sheet. Um, so I think that it's just probably like politically way easier and operationally they can do it way, I mean, without, you know, it's just easier, I think, for them to do that and they just prefer to do it. And also, I mean, also the bailouts just have a bad a bad stigma. People just hate bailouts and everyone gets angry when they say they're going to do a bailout. But if they're like, well, we're going to buy like one junk bond, like I don't think they're going to get the backlash. So I think that's kind of their bailout plan for right now is just, you know, try to do some bond buying. Um, but as I, but as I pointed out, they're not barely doing any bond buying at all. They're just announcing they're going to do it and they haven't really done it. And so the market has responded to them saying that maybe they'll do it <laughs> basically, but now the balance sheet's even coming down. They're not doing it right now. Um, unless they're unloading what, I mean, what are they going to be doing? Selling treasuries or mortgage backed securities and maybe buying some couple bonds while they're selling those. But yeah, what are they, what are they selling? The balance sheet's coming down. What are they selling? Maybe mortgage backed securities. I don't think they're going to sell treasuries right now. I don't know what they're doing right now, but the balance sheet's coming down. Um, so that's interesting. Internet economy is only 5% of the economy. So does that mean blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Reinvestment uh, runway on most internet driven business. So yeah, if, <laughs> if the internet's only 5% of the economy. Why is it outperforming like everything in the entire market? Yeah, because that's what people want, I guess. It doesn't have to make sense, guys. Stop trying to make sense. <laughs> There's no such thing as fundamentals. All right, the week after June, the triple witching days, <laughs> Dow Jones losses. Okay. So that's pretty common to lose. To have a down day right now, and we had a down day. <laughs> Will it or won't it? Oh, and this is an earlier one. So we saw one that was pointing out sort of a double top. And maybe it's a double top. Like, okay, it came down and went back up, so you draw a line. But, like, it could just keep going back up. I mean, like, here's a target on this side. If it goes down, you call it a double top. But, I mean, th yeah, this this move down is serious. And this rally after that move down, okay. Like I think this is a legit kind of um, a technical setup because of this huge candle here uh, that the rally back to that point is significant. And so I think that's important to to watch. What? Uh, let me okay. Let me pause this. Let me go over to the charts. I'll take a look at. Well, I'll take a look at the Nasdaq first. All right, so here's the Nasdaq. So I mean, obviously you had this insane run here. There's a general bull market line, and uh, you can see. I don't even know when I threw this bull market line in. I think I threw this in like like three or four weeks ago. Um, but yeah, you kind of kind of popped and broke below it, and now we have pretty much back tested this thing and done a double top and had a little bit of a down move today. Um, yeah, so that's a technical setup that looks a little bit risky. And then obviously just here, I mean, we had a we had a bounce. This is really cool. These are all lines that I had in here way before any of this stuff happened. Um, yeah, so this is our Volmageddon line. This is a two-year trend line off the bottom of the 2018 bottom. 
And the NASDAQ, I mean, just blew right past this thing and has checked off and, you know, it bounced off of the top of this and it's using it as support. But now it's sort of uh, back testing this bull market line and it has a little bit of a down day. So um, this looks like it could come down and it looks like the top of this line is a target. And so if the NASDAQ actually wants to come down, I think the shape that you'd be looking for, uh, this is already sufficient to come down. Like this is a, a back, a back double, a double hit back test and a down move. That's plenty of technical stuff. <laughs> plenty of technical moves here to get a, to get a down move. Um, but usually, usually what you'll see, this is already, yeah, we don't need another back test. So, like if this is your line and this is an actual bear move, like you'll want to break this line and usually you'll come down, not quite to it and do like a little dead cat bounce, slice it and then back test it. And so as far as a bear market move on the NASDAQ goes, like that's, that's the kind of move that you'd be looking for. And it's not super substantial because we're just here close to that line. But um, if this is like a real bear market move from there, uh, you have this as the next target, and who knows what kind of trading on the way down there. I mean, there's not really any kind of, there's not really any support. There's no levels. I mean, this is such a smooth run up, and once you break and backtest this thing, it's kind of, I mean, if the market wants to drop, that's the next target. So, so this is what I was talking about with the NASDAQ is, I mean, you have to be pretty ballsy to short this thing because this is, you know, the Infotech kind of stocks that are in here are some of the only companies still doing stock buybacks, still pushing the shares up. And these are big companies that, you know, international money wants to flow into. And so there's, as far as, far as like a sector to short, this is like the dumbest sector to short, um, except for, well, if you're in like a, if you're in a contraction phase, like these tech stocks don't generally do well in a contraction phase. So if you want to call a contraction phase and if you want to target these kind of tech stocks as a decent downward target for that reason, like, yeah, these, these stocks pretty much do well in any conditions except a, you know, a monetary contraction. So, um, there's some hints that we might get another contraction and it should be a contraction in the U S banks and not the international banks this time. And so the U S yeah, tech stocks, if that happens, I don't know what the percentage chance of that is pretty low. I think at this point, um, but without talking about the percentage chance, just the setup, if it did happen, and this would include Tesla, um, which the Tesla puts are kind of expensive. Probably the NASDAQ puts are normal priced and you're getting a lot of Tesla here. So um, as, a, as a low percentage chance, but a big percentage move, because I mean, you know, if we, if we broke and back tested this thing and it looked like we're gonna get downside movement, like it's a reasonable target uh, to get down to the next trend line. And this is, you know, this is like the financial crisis trend line, the 12 year line that comes off the bottom of the financial crisis as far as the NASDAQ goes. And we didn't ever get down to it last time. And we broke and passed the Bulmageddon line here. So, yeah. Um, yeah, a low percentage short, but high downside short because you're shorting from, well, almost like 100 down to like, whatever it is, 65 or 66, not, I mean, not quite half, but, but yeah, close to half. That would be a monstrous, a monstrous short if, uh, you know, in, in a one month period, potentially like this, this liquidation solve came at this angle. So, I mean, if you did that angle all the way down here, not saying this is probable or something like that, but just potentially it would be. A month, about a month. 
Yeah, so I mean, just with the angles and the trend lines, like a, a, a maximum bear case move could be about a month uh, to move all the way down to that line, you know, so if you did like a, not investment advice, but you know, you do a, whatever, a six month kind of put option or something like that. Um, and I mean, yeah, if that move is really gonna happen, you could go like way out of the money and just crush and get like 10 or 20 X on that move. Um, anyway, that that's the, that's the sort of double top kind of setup. And there's more than a double top going on here, as you can see. Um, on the bullish side, we're above the support line and we have bounced off of it. So this is bullish, super bullish to be above, above a long-term support trend line again. And so if you bounce off here and start using this line as support, that's a long-term bullish support line. And that's a kind of bullish scenario that is not in any other market except the NASDAQ. Like all the other markets are definitely still down here below this line and they're back testing and breaking off of this line. The NASDAQ sold off at the same time as the other stocks, but it's above. And so, I mean, but yeah, basically this does look bearish. This, this setup looks very bearish. This looks like a double top that is back, back testing this support line this green kind of bull run line that we've had here and it just looks like it wants to break down to here um that's it sort of as a bearish setup but if it breaks and back tests this thing and it sets up a bearish scenario well the most normal scenario from there would be to kind of swing out and then kind of head back to that line that's sort of when you break a when you break a trend line on the backside of a bubble. So you have, you know, the everything bubble blow off top here, and then you back test the line here. That's a good clean back test and a good swing here. And you, in a, in a bear market bubble case, you would expect to stay under the line, but we've gone above it, bounced off of it. And so now you have to go through the whole process of actually breaking the line and back testing it again. And then you could do kind of the swing out to where you actually do the, the final test uh, where you break it and then you could get down. So that's kind of the bubblish outlook on the NASDAQ. It's pretty bullish, obviously still it's a huge run. It's up here above everything. And so the NASDAQ has kind of a lot of work to do uh, to even to even back test this line, it has work to do. And then to actually break down to that one, who I mean it wouldn't it wouldn't fall vertically like that, obviously. Um, you know, this, this is a super aggressive angle to sell. That is, I can't imagine a steeper one than that. That's crazy. Um, less steep than that. And that, and my goodness, like if you follow this trend line up, you're almost at the same height here as you would be there. I mean, this could swing, this could swing out for a year, two years or something, and then it could back test and kind of break down. It doesn't have to automatically sell down, even if it's the backside of a bubble. Like you get a year out and then you can swing down into a whole like range in here where there's not a support line and just kind of get some action. Like that's what you see on like some other bubbles. Uh, you just get kind of like a little bit of a breakdown. It doesn't have to automatically break to the next line, but um, if you go look at like the Nikkei or something like that, I mean, the Nikkei does, it does this kind of stuff along the top level line and the Nikkei just goes like rip, like 70% drop or something on the second move. It just rips like, like crazy, like from a super, super high support line way up here, way down. Um, so it can happen and it does happen in a lot of bubbles. It, it, it happens where you, you get a, you know, a lot of kind of boring, not that this is boring. I mean, this is really aggressive, but in a lot of bubbles, you know, you just get some boring action under the trend line, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And then it finally like terminates, finally terminates this long bull line kind of tangent. And it just 
reigns down to the next line. And then and then you can get a, a bunch of different things. Like um, once you get to the next line, uh, sometimes you break and back test the thing and swing under it again. Uh, sometimes you just swing all across it. Uh, sometimes you swing under it and you reverse up into a higher trend line off of that one. Like this is a floor that holds. And so when you do break down uh, on a bubble, there's a lot of different cases that have happened in different bubbles where, um, well, like on the, on the Nikkei, it was like kind of the worst case scenario where it was long term kind of depressionary scenario and it swung around the, the floor trend line and oh no <laughs> and then it and then it broke out into a long-term bear market underneath it um yeah that was the the deflationary scenario on the nikkei that was a major one uh eh, yeah well whatever let's go over to the s p what did we get how far did we break down yeah we broke down pretty good we broke down underneath all the stuff and so that yeah, we got a single, we got a single back test here. So what I was talking about earlier in my last video, when, when this was swinging up kind of pre-market, I was saying kind of for a bear setup, you might want to see a, a double hit on this. And then if you get the double tap, like that is really, really good. <laughs> this moving average is completely broken. This has nothing to do with anything. This is supposed to be a 120 moving average running through the middle of the chart, and it's just like, it's completely broken. Yeah, we have a moving average up here at 56 million or something. Let me see if I can get this thing to actually look like a moving average one day. Close. Nah, it's broken. Okay, forget it. Anyway, I'll just... Uh, I'll just point at where that thing should be. <laughs> that that moving average kind of runs through this area in here, somewhere in here. And so that that is basically the downside target from here would be towards that moving average. And this, this looks like it's turning over. I think that's gonna, I think that's gonna turn over now. That's enough downside. That's enough downside to follow through now. Um, so earlier I was looking at this, this double check on this line and saying, you know, it should turn over and it did. And then it needs to close lower to actually follow through. And then your target is that moving average. But, uh, but you know, yesterday we didn't get, we didn't get a follow through. We got to move up in this pretty boring thing here. And now we've got a rejection and it has, it's closed lower so that's enough to get a to get a bearish move down to that moving average wherever in here somewhere here 29.99 somewhere in there and so probably yeah that's a super super dramatic close to finish on kind of a bear move that looks like it could go you know that could follow through for a couple of days that move and now the whole weekend is happening and really the market doesn't wait for the weekend. For example, there's a good one over here. Oh, and I'm on like one hour chart or something like that. But there's a lot of people that are pointing at, I don't remember which area it is. I think like right in here, like if you go out on a farther chart, it looks like there's a big gap in here. Yeah, where it jumps from like, the 21st to the 24th like that shows up as a big gap on most charts uh, but really it's just it's just some pretty normal looking down movement uh over a weekend and so the down movement doesn't wait for the weekend like this is this is a model of the financial system of the expansion and the contraction of the financial system and that's why i was pointing out with the fed balance sheet going down that is contracting the financial system domestically which should affect the u.s stock market and also the treasury general account is still going up they're still issuing a dumb amount of bonds and that is all taking liquidity out of the market that they're holding they hold it out of the market and 
it's for government spending, but it hasn't been spent yet. So that's just taking money out of the market as well. So really they're taking money out of the system on both ends right now, uh, domestically with the domestic US dollar. As far as the international uh, money, there's still probably a mess of money that came from the Fed over the last couple of months in the international markets that they could move into the US market. Um, but it sounds like they're they're reversing that and taking money out of the US and putting it back into their own markets like in Europe and stuff like that as Europe's reopening. It sounds like they're rebalancing money back the other way now. So it sounds like there should be less liquidity and less liquidity is just kind of down downward move. Um, yeah, so what I was saying is this can and probably will at this point do a multi-day kind of move down but you have the whole weekend so i mean a multi-day move down could it could open down you know monday really you could you could do the whole move just monday because monday includes the weekend um just kind of a look at where it closed and yeah it did the rising wedge reversal thing that's a pretty standard kind of reversal pattern and so really the the wedge only that reversal pattern just on its own should only drop to here to the bottom of the where the wedge was and it's already closed a little bit below so that that technical pattern on its own doesn't suggest falling any farther than where it is really right now like it could do anything from here just on that one technical pattern but if you follow the rejection off of the major trend line and the back testing of this whole bull market line, like this is a huge. And then, I mean, obviously, if you go look at the VIX, which let's do that now. Uh, if you look at the VIX, like the VIX was pressing up while we had that flat top reversal off of the Volmageddon line. And that transitioned into a big drop and a big blast here. And then the VIX was trying to push down. Yeah. And that move today just pushed the VIX back up. So. This is nasty. Um, you know, those are long, long term, like a two year support line that got rejected down. And then the whole bull market line for the last three months just got back tested and rejected. So, I mean, all of that stuff is indicating a bigger move down than just a little wedge. Uh, yeah, pretty much already completed the wedge just today. So that's kind of a look at the liquidity and the volatility. I think those are the best things to look at. What happened with with the other stuff? Financials moved down a tiny amount. Oh, um, small caps moved down a tiny amount. So what really sold off? I don't even know what sold off so hard. If the uh, you know the financials and the small caps are kind of the ones that have the most downside risk, I think, and they didn't even move that much. So something sold off, but I don't know what it is. Tesla up. Oh, around a thousand still. Tesla's absolutely insane. And this is a, you know, this is kind of the same shape as the general NASDAQ. And there's a few more kind of support lines and things like that with Tesla that look a little bit different than the NASDAQ. But actually this, this kind of angled support line here on Tesla is pretty close to the bull market line on the NASDAQ. So move to here is not weird, I think. Uh, but we're still above, we're still above these lines using them as support and blasted straight past this downward trend on Tesla. So it's, it's a bullish kind of setup on the NASDAQ. Um, and that, that's pretty interesting because, you know, the, everything sold off together last time. And so, you know, if you get bearish Russell's and bearish financials and, bearish VIX and bearish S&P movements and everything like that, probably the NASDAQ would come down at the same time just because everything's been moving together. Like not only all the sectors in the U.S., but like all the other markets across the whole world have been waving in a similar pattern. So, so yeah, you can kind of use anything to predict anything else at this point still because there's just a huge correlation between everything. Um, so that, that's probably good. It's probably good for now. What did the VVIX do? 
not a huge move up. So the VIX made a decent pushback up and the volatility of volatility made a smaller move back up. But as you can see, the, the vol of all is popped up a lot higher than the VIX right now. And so that's kind of a upward, it kind of pulls the VIX with it. So this is trying to pull the VIX up more. So I think this is a good setup for a VIX breakout to the upside. Oh, and the dollar, did I look at the dollar? Yeah, let's check out the DXY. So the VIX looks like it wants to break out to the upside. Yeah, and I have the dollar kind of target here. So there's a moving average on the dollar. Yeah, right around there, around 99. And the dollar looks like it's breaking up. So I have a dollar target right there around 100, around the moving average, right at that angle. And so this dollar break is bad for the S&P. This VIX level is bad for the S&P, especially with the vault, with the VVIX above the VIX. Uh, that's that's bad for the S&P. What's the bond spreads doing? Oh, not, yeah, it was pushing down. It kind of chilled out. So we have a little bit of a steepening yield curve on the, on the treasuries. That's not really much of a predictor from here. What's the put calls? What is the put calls? And it's gone bullish. So the put call ratio has gone bullish. Uh, meanwhile, there's a big crash in the market on close. And so the last time it went real bullish was where we had that huge reversal and it was bullish to the tune of something like 12 million call contracts at the top. And I doubt, I doubt this is anything similar to that, but it has pushed a little bullish, which usually when the, when people go, when people go bearish, the market goes bullish and when people go bullish, the market, that's when the market will flip. Not like every time in reverse, but it just seems to always catch people with their pants down. Like when they go too aggressively in the wrong direction. And so, right, I mean, right now it's pretty near the middle. This is no big deal. Uh, so most of the indicators are whatever, not that big of a deal, but uh, the VIX is a big deal and the dollar is a big deal. And that's about it. Yeah, I mean, the breakdown formation here doesn't have to follow through from there, but that it really looks like it wants to. That is super, super bearish. And you saw the, the action on the smaller chart. All right. Well, this is not investment advice. I've kind of, I don't know, kind of rambled on, but that's a really cool site in the market year. And, you know, they, they don't have a, a bias. They just post all kinds of stuff. And that, you know, it could be nonsense kind of stuff. It usually doesn't have a huge analysis. It just kind of throws a chart up and says, look at this and this. And uh, I think it's really cool. I mean, you know, we went through it and it's a bunch of very relevant stuff that a lot of people are not talking about, especially the Fed balance sheet is a huge one that I've been talking about all day today. The Fed balance sheet is going down, down the first time in a year or something like that. And so that's massive. Um, the other indicators are kind of wishy-washy, a little bit of up, a little bit of down stuff. Um, but as far as the bearish case, the bearish case is still just this bubble model. Like we're underneath this major trend line. We didn't break it. We rejected off of it. And now we have a whole bearish kind of setup reversal off of the bull market line. We've broken under it and reversed off of it. So that, and that wants to go down. <clears throat> that wants to go down. And it's just really the target here is just that moving average. But then obviously this line is the next target. Uh, if it keeps doing that kind of movement. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it like bounce off that and maybe break that. But if we get all the way down here and back test this thing, then that's a major thing. Then that is like into the second level of the bearish case, the bear market. And we have to really look at the bond rates and see if this looks like a long-term bear market at this point. Um, yeah, so we'll worry about that later. But, you know, usually uh, if you break this thing, you, you'll swing out and come back to it. That's kind of what happens most of the time on the backside of a bubble is you kind of break it 
back test it once or twice, and then you swing out and get back to it. And so, I mean, basically that's what we've done here. We back tested the thing, double back tested it, and then we swung out and gave it a good test here. Um, but the only thing here is that the rip was so, so deep here, and these lines are so close together that we broke through this one and went all the way back through it. So basically all of this, this whole crash and recovery kind of had like a falsely low bottom that usually usually you don't break two trend lines at once on the backside of a bubble. Usually, like like if you go look at the Nikkei or something like that or any of the other bubbles, really any of them, um, what you do is you, you know, you break and back test, that's normal. And then you can swing out, like swinging out and testing the thing over here is not weird, but usually you wouldn't break below this line and just forget about it and come back up. Like you would, you would be, you know, swinging in here and testing it, not <laughs> way down here. Um, so this, I mean, yeah, this is a crazy, this is a crazy chart already. And, and we'll see what we get. It's a pretty interesting one. And I guess the other thing that I was pointing out uh, in the last video that's pretty wild is just um, just the super high volatility that we have now. And this is Volmageddon. This is where the vol volatility kicked. And we have this kind of space, this huge, huge freaking space with super high volatility. And we have the ability to cross this thing edge to edge like this. And that could happen up or down. Over the next three years, it's entirely possible to just go like rip and rip. Like it could be absolutely nuts. Uh, not saying that will happen, but it's entirely possible that it could happen. And if it does, oh my God, like, well, I mean, I guess there's massive opportunity for some, maybe some puts or some call options in that kind of a scenario, but. I mean, wow, like if the market is doing stuff like that, it's just going to be absolutely insane. Um, could happen, but let's see what we get like next week. Let's see if this little down move continues and then we can worry about that, that kind of stuff later. So this is Brian Lewis with MMT Investing and uh, whatever, hit the subscribe button. I don't even remember what I started talking about. I don't know what this video is going to be called. I need to come up with something good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is a long one, but this covers a ton of stuff and maybe, you know, maybe help you out with some, some kind of strategy stuff because there's just so much stuff going on right now in the market. It's just crazy. And yeah, the the you know the valuations and the actual I mean the actual economy is a worldwide depression. I mean, according to the Fed's balance sheet, we had a recession for like one month, like right at the beginning of this crash, and it's over. Um, but yeah, you know, America's in a recession. I I, get, I mean, I guess they say they've, they're showing that the recession's over. So but the whole world is in a worldwide depression. America's done with their recession. Everything's fine. Um, but the unemployment rate is at epic historical levels and people probably are not going to get their jobs back. And, you know, the virus is exploding, starting to explode again. They just shut down a ton of schools in China and shut down a ton of more flights. So. You know, we're having kind of a second wave thing starting in China now, but most of the world hasn't even really opened up again yet. Um, but international travel has a bunch of problems because who knows what country is going to have what problems at what point and any countries can just shut down travel. Um, yeah, so as far as the airlines, man, the airlines are looking really scary, especially for international kind of stuff. Uh, the government may issue credits for Americans to travel domestically in America, and they're giving like tax credits for domestic travel. So maybe they'll give you four grand, and you can fly to Vegas and gamble with it and write it off on your taxes. 
I don't know how that works. It sounds pretty ridiculous. That's the kind of stuff they're talking about doing right now. Um, and you saw the Treasury General account. They have a trillion and a half dollars they could do it with uh, in like one day. And so that that's the kind of, um, you know, just like the VIX, the volatility index is one thing, but the real world volatility is all of that stuff. I mean, the virus, you know, resurfacing all of a sudden or social unrest breaking out or um, the government just blasting a trillion and a half dollars of actual spending helicopter money into the economy. And how's that going to affect markets or, you know, the Fed, like you get to see the Fed update every week, but you don't really know what they're doing. And, and you know, if they're pumping money to international banks or they're pumping money to domestic, you know, smaller banks or what, you don't know where they're sending it. There's a lot of things they can do now. They have a ton of programs. They have the ability to pump money places. So just the real world volatility, like the uncertainty of what could be happening without you really even getting to see it. You know, most of this, most of this evaluation stuff is happening like, oh, oh, okay, now, like a week later, we see what the Fed was doing the past week. Um, so that doesn't help you this whole week, you know, this whole week, you know, we're trading and we don't know what's up with the balance sheet. And then we find out, oh, well, oh, they were decreasing the balance sheet the whole week. Like, oh, that's like super, you know, super bearish thing. Like everyone thinks they're blowing the balance sheet up to crazy levels and they're sitting here bringing it down. And that, I knew they were going to do it. I knew it. I said that, I said that like three videos, like, look, it's flat now. I bet they're going to bring it down from here. But, but Jerome Powell is testifying. He testified. And during his testimony, he said that they are going to at least continue where they're from now. And they can buy bonds and all that stuff. And way in the future, when the whole crisis is over, they'll hold the balance sheet, not even decrease it, just hold it and let the economy kind of catch up. That is what he said in testimony. And during that, during that time, the balance sheet was going down and we just got those numbers posted. So he just straight up lied in testimony about what they're doing with the balance sheet um, while they were, while they were contracting it. So, I mean, usually, yeah, usually they don't, they don't lie like that. I mean, they, you know, they'll say whatever sounds good and try to get people positive on the market, but not, not just blatantly lie about the balance sheet because they post the thing. It's public. So whatever. That's what we get. That's what we get now. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy. And, uh, yeah, and so it's a bearish setup for now. Um, it's kind of it's kind of been a bearish look, you know, since we rejected off of that, off of that, you know, the two-year trend line, and it looks like it's continuing out now. So uh, that's just a target down to that moving average, which is not not that far down. And then we'll see we'll see what it looks like in hyper trading. <laughs>